This is the Brave New Coin Crypto Conversation, hosted by Andy Pickering. Hi everyone, Andy Pickering here. I'm your host and welcome to the Crypto Conversation, a Brave New Coin podcast where we talk to the people building the future in the Bitcoin, blockchain and cryptocurrency space. My guest today is Caden Stadelman. Caden is a blockchain developer, operations security expert, and the Komodo Platform's chief technology officer. Caden's background includes coding from an early age, which led him to becoming an ethical or white hat hacker, which in turn led to operations security and penetration testing at the nation state level. And from there, the only natural path is to follow on into cryptography and down the blockchain rabbit hole. Welcome to the show, Caden. Oh, hi, Andy. Hi, thanks for having me. Why don't we start off just briefly on your background, Caden, because it's, it's a little bit interesting, it's a little bit different. I understand that you were raised in northern Africa as the son of, I think, an Austrian diplomat and an African school teacher. Is, is that right? Tell me, uh, tell me about that. That's absolutely correct, yes. So uh, my father worked for the Austrian government in uh, different countries, third world countries especially, and in the end of the 80s, he landed in a northern African country um, in the diplomatic score. That's also where he got to know my mother. I was raised in that country and later on settled over to Central Europe, where I enjoyed uh, my school education, um, as well as like later on so joined like different university courses, studied in an Austrian and in a Swiss university, and also found my way to the IT, DevSec, and OpSec sector. And they tell me that you started coding, you know, simple ac applications and playing around with taking calculators apart and that kind of stuff from quite a young age. Is, is that right? Yes, correctly. So I've like put first my hands on Visual Basic and, and Basic script, uh, like uh, coding lang. Uh, something provided back in the day from the uh, company Microsoft. Uh, I'm, I'm sure like uh, most old devs are aware of this. Uh, and that's also like how I actually first started playing with the logic and what's happening like behind the program, what's happening like on, on, a, on an application layer. And I was always like pretty curious like on how, how something does work. And I've always had like this interest for mathematics and for numbers. And I guess that's also like the reason how I, I got into like building a, a calculator and like basic macros and like calculation uh, executing scripts back in the day. You must have had a, a natural ability to code. And I'm always fascinated by people like yourself who do have this natural ability. And I'm fascinated by... Uh, so many guests that I've had on the podcast, Caden, you know, they, they've had some kind of military or government uh, operation security background. Like um, I had on Mance Harmon from Hedera. He, he was working with the U.S. Navy missile defense systems and, and the war gaming that goes into them. Had on, I don't know if you know, Tal Cole from Orbs. He was an officer in Israel's Elite 8200 unit. And now you are... You have a, a similar sort of background, so I know you know not everyone likes to go into this stuff in too much detail, but tell me what does it mean to be a nation state penetration tester? Pretty much would depend like on the on the specific area you're involved in and and uh, the work packages you get handed off. but in, in my case, for example, the responsibilities cover like a lot of different like implementations. Um, in this area of, of uh, IT security, cybersecurity. So it, it started with like integrating and implementing various intrusion detection systems, um, basically tracking down malicious packages in a network. And furthermore, not only tracking these malicious packages down and basically detecting them, but also implementing like countermeasures on, on a routing protocol layer, for example. It might be like a little bit too technical, but I just like want to give you like a quick view, like in, in, in a simple example, what Please. this work also included, for example, to basically inject small data pieces into such malicious data packages, which would allow you, right, from a government and, and an authority level uh, position, be able to gather like informations regarding the 
the, the source, but also the destination of this package, since you would be able to uh, communicate with uh, various uh, internet service providers and uh, centralized uh, network relay nodes, where you basically would be able to track that malicious package down to its end node. So even if someone, for example, uh, was hiding behind a, a virtual private network and different like proxy uh, routing protocols that basically help people to hide themselves, uh, even in, in that case, you would be able to track this package down almost on the physical layer, right? Because no matter where, how someone like is routing this package, you'd be able to track back like specific elements of this package. And this was like one of, of these um, tasks. Uh, however, like working in this uh, OPSEC and, and DEFSEC environment for a government uh, um, organization, uh, of course, does involve a, a lot more different uh, work. Um, also, for example, uh, implementing, giving training to other government uh, organizations, um, working closely with law enforcement agencies. Um, these topics like IT cyber forensics and uh, everything basically related to uh, IT on, on a government layer, but like on, on, from a security perspective, was part of our responsibilities, the responsibility of the department division that I worked. How would you characterize the, I guess, the OPSEC field today as we come to the end of 2019? Because to me, it feels like, you know, there's this push and pull with government systems, especially because at the one level, you have the intelligence agencies. And, you know, thanks to people like Snowden, we know exactly what they're up to. You know, basically, they're in everyone's business all of the time. And of course, Google, Facebook, Amazon, they're in everyone's business all the time as well. And yet, at bureaucratic level, I suppose you would say, government systems always seem to be a little bit not so much out of date, but, you know, they're bloated and there's a lot of the security isn't great, you know, exploits are, are quick and easy to find. What, how would you summarize the, the state of play at the moment? So speaking in general, I'd say like that uh, the threats in the cyberspace, but also all these various attack uh, scenarios and even like the attack surface itself that gives malicious actors even the chance to act maliciously is growing. It's like growing by beyond the, um, the, the rate and, and, and scope that um, I'd say would allow the wider space and the, this wider uh, industry that would allow them like to basically implement like countermeasures in, a, in an, an, an appropriate like in a timely manner and um, I, I personally or even like I, I'd say like the cyberspace itself is does agree that there is some sort of like cyber war ongoing and there's one like very important detail that I always would like to to highlight when it comes to cyberspace to security uh, and decentralization itself is that no matter how decentralized the software is that we're using, no matter like how huge this peer-to-peer -peer network is, we'd always have to ask ourselves one question, and that is like, where is this software running, right? I mean, we're all using infrastructure, government's infrastructure, infrastructure of uh, ISPs and and um, centralized DNS uh, um, uh, nodes and providers. Uh, that are centrally controlled. So, um, although the technology may be very decentralized, at the end of the day, the underlying physical layer, basically the whole base foundation, is pretty centralized, right? So, th that's something that's actually like very, very interesting when it comes to decentralized software. And I think unless there's a real alternative, um, basically second or decentralized internet, it will be, be like pretty problematic topic, this IT, uh, cyber, uh, OPSEC and DEFSEC uh, uh, layer. And just like to get back to your question regarding uh, nowadays, today's situation, um, I, I, I'd say that definitely we're at the point where there are so many threats and, and, and so many risks in, in this cyber world that we all have to be aware of this and to have ex, to be extra cautious because I also think that nowadays users or the majority of their users aren't really, people don't take it like really serious, don't take this uh, OPSEC, DEFSEC area serious, right? So unless you've been like victim to some, some uh, 
a hack or to a virus or a, a worm, people likely won't even have antivirus or basic firewalls set up. That's right. It's just human nature. Everyone treats their online activity fairly casually until it's too late. Let's start to move towards blockchain then, Caden. How did you get attracted to the blockchain space. Did you come from the technology side with your background as as a coder, even you know as a as a white hat hacker, or was it the the attraction of helping to build out the decentralized global economy? What was your path into blockchain? So um, my path initially was actually that I started, yeah, researching and and trying to read into topics into technologies that I believed um, have the power to yeah, change the world, if you want to put it like that. And uh, I mean, it didn't start directly with Bitcoin or blockchain based applications, but more like the underlying ideas and visions of this technology, basically like the peer to peer uh, model and like how basic decentralized uh, and also like cryptographically layered uh, software functions. And that's how I came across like different um, peer-to-peer technologies such as like BitTorrent um, and, and other uh, protocols that were made for, 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 for privacy, like for example, the Onion Routing Protocol, I2P, etc. Um, and that's also how I actually um, came across like uh, cryptocurrencies, how I came across uh, the blockchain itself, this topic. And I've, uh, yeah, pretty early like felt that it, it has power, it has the power to change, to revolutionize, not just like the financial system, but I think even the whole over uh, overlaying society model that is heavily based and, and um, relying and depending on this uh, financial system. And that's that's something that like um, f- really fascinated me. And I mean, I come like from a completely different background and I've gone like through yeah, like a somehow difficult time in my life where I just like was questioning, right, uh, the work that governments do and Right. I mean, we all grow up like as kids. We always think, oh, that's that's that. government. Like, is 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 the basically the 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 good element. It's the good, and we always think that everything is fair. And but I think if if you join like um, specific organizations and uh, authorities, that that you may start to think a little bit different when you actually see like how easy it is like to gather information regarding like some random citizen and that uh, privacy is is actually like some sort of illusion right if if i if i'm allowed to 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 put it like that that there is no real privacy and that we as like citizens uh, are being like generally watched just like the way technology has been implemented the way social media networks function the way internet functions and um, yeah, I mean, that, that, that were things that gave me a lot of question. And I, I think I was able to fill this void with, with this decentralized layer. That was also like how I got into the, the blockchain community. I mean, initially, I was really just like uh, heavily focusing on the security layer. So I was just reaching out to various projects and engaging a lot, like in the Bitcoin talk back in the day, various crypto coin uh, talk communities, hacker boards, etc. That's also how I got in touch with uh, people or many people that I work with today. So reading between the lines then, Caden, I mean, it is a, I think that's a, a fairly common story and it, it does make sense to me. You know, if you spend enough time behind the curtain you know, government agencies, how they operate, probably does give you pause to reflect. And it sounds like you've, yeah, you've come at things from a cypherpunk angle. Yeah, no, I think that's quite interesting. Komodo then. So Komodo is described as an open, composable, multi-chain platform at a high level. Caden, what is Komodo? Okay, at a very high level. I mean, I, I once explained a, a close friend like what I personally see in Komodo in completely non-technical and non-crypto words. And f- for me, Komodo was this huge like mothership, right? A huge spaceship 
which like many small spaceships can dock onto, but still remain a fully uh, standalone and independent uh, layer. This is what Komodo is. Komodo like gives all these external third-party projects uh, a full, a huge, uh, a very mighty suite of different uh, blockchain applications, tools and frameworks that uh, provide technology layer that reflects our initial vision. And, and that was basically connecting all blockchains, creating this blockchain interoperability layer. So with Komodo, in, in simple words, you could create your own blockchain. And by doing so, you don't rely on Komodo itself. It's, it's not like other similar platforms that offer like this chain creation. With Komodo, you get your own fully independent a smart chain, like it's a standalone blockchain that would inherit all of Komodo's features. So you would literally get your own Komodo, your own blockchain system that would also contain a decentralized exchange. Just like to name one of these tools, probably one of the most important tools that also like provides this huge interoperability layer and literally bridging Komodo, all Komodo smart chains, but also other completely independent protocol based chains like ERC20 tokens or Ethereum itself, but also all Bitcoin based protocols. And, and Komodo would allow you to bridge all these chains, right? Apart from just offering a, a very easy to use blockchain creation and customization interface it also breaches the, the whole crypto uh, industry. Look, I appreciate you, Caden, uh, describing that in non-crypto terms, but how would you describe Komodo's unique point of difference then? Or what, is there a Komodo killer app? Our killer app, uh, if, if I might put it like that, I mean, we have like a few killer apps and one of these killer apps is Antara Composer. It's like the Komodo's um, blockchain creation suit that would allow you to create a blockchain to spin up the whole infrastructure that you would need to run an initial peer-to-peer -peer network, but also to fully customize your blockchain with like different features, right? So you'd be able to modify the consensus layer, basically the cryptographic layer and would have like a fully customized chain. That's like one thing, one tool that we are offering. But the other, I'd say like probably the most exciting tool and app that, that Komodo does offer to the, to the industry is Atomic DEX, right? It's like the, our third generation uh, uh, cross-chain Atomic DEX uh, system. It's a fully platform independent. It's, it's operating system independent. So this is like mobile ready. We have a production ready app out uh, currently in the beta stage, public beta stage for Android as well as for iOS. And uh, this is like a true DEX, a true cross-chain atomic DEX system that's, that, that proved itself by uh, up to date like over 200,000 cross-chain atomic swaps in this network. And as aforementioned, we, we cover up almost 99% of the coin market cap list. So um, pretty much all ERC20 tokens, uh, Bitcoin protocol based uh, tokens, everything's really covered by Atomic DAX. Well, let's just dig into this a little bit more then, Caden, because I know you guys have been working on the Atomic DAX for a long time now, and it's gone through, uh, I guess, a few iterations, and I, and I think, yeah, you've made some pretty good progress with it. So let's start at the beginning. What is a DAX? Let's just understand what a decentralized exchange here is and, and how what, what are the advantages of it. So a decentralized exchange um, basically is a, a trading platform um, where the traders or, or the parties that, that deal and that trade with each other are directly interconnected. So there is no middleman, like no intermediate layer, um, sort of like controlling or, or handling or even like regulating this transaction. So just for a very simple example, if, if I trade my Bitcoins against your Litecoins, we would... Um, execute this trade just peer to peer in a fully decentralized manner. And this whole process would also be blockchain based. So um, actually utilizing cryptographic uh, mechanisms and, and mathematics to ensure that these trading parties 
aren't even technically able to do any harm to each other. So uh, let's say I, I want to trade with you and I decide or I decide to try to scam you. I just like end up with, with probably wasting transaction fees and your funds won't even arrive to my address unless I've sent you your funds. So the, the cross-chain atomic swap and, and this tech, the DEX itself, would ensure that such a transaction um, is like provably fair and there are like no ways of scamming a trading partner. And so can you explain exactly what an atomic swap means and how it works? Because I know it essentially it means, as you say, that, you know, I can swap my Bitcoin for your Litecoin. And talk me through how that actually works. It's a complicated process made seamless or easy. That's the, that's the idea behind an, an atomic swap, right? Exactly. Exactly. So behind the lines or like from a tech perspective, what would happen like uh, like on the application layer and behind the GOI and behind what the user actually sees is that when I decide like to trade with you and you decide to trade with me, we'll basically have a negotiation going on in a decentralized network, right? So as soon as we agree on, on a trade, that would first of all, there's basically some sort like of a, a security deposit being done by one trading part, party, right? Um, that would ensure that uh, the other party can't be scammed. So, uh, worst case, even if one like the, one trading partner decides to not send the the funds to finalize the atomic swap, there would be this security deposit that would ensure that there is no financial damage. And a cross-chain atomic swap basically means that you would have this process taking place between two completely different blockchains. So um, in our example, let, let's say like Komodo and, and Bitcoin. And we have Atomic DEX itself, the, the DEX network, which is connected to all supported blockchains. So Atomic DEX would basically be routing this negotiation data traffic, right? And uh, the different orders, etc. But the trade itself would be like 100% taking place on the blockchain. And there are special transaction types, right? It's similar like, to, for example, the multi-signature transactions, right? I'm sure you know these. It's, it's basically something very similar, but we're utilizing like... Um, like time and hash locked transactions which would basically be like a transaction that has a specific condition and unless a specific condition is met the transaction wouldn't be able to be spent right at, at the end so we're utilizing this technology in, in order to provide end users and, and DEX users a, a decentralized uh, trading experience without any central parties between the trading partners. And so I know, as I said before, you guys have been working on atomic swaps for a few years now. And I think most people, if they've heard of Komodo, just at a super high level, they know that's what you guys have been doing. It's the atomic decks, the atomic swaps. But, you know, 2019, Caden, was, I think, you know, probably, say, a year ago, people were thinking, 2019, this will be the year of the decks. The decentralized exchanges will start to... To take off, but and I suppose that you could, you know, I have seen some reports that suggest DEX user numbers and transaction volumes are increasing, which is good to see. But it, you know, still a, a drop in the bucket compared to the volume that's happening on either centralized exchanges or derivatives platforms. How and when will that change? And I suppose from your point of view, you need to make a DEX easy enough for anyone to use seamlessly because obviously the you know the user experience today has been fairly clunky so uh, tell, you know talk me through where where the trend is going i suppose and and what you think needs to happen for dexes to really take off so first of all i think yeah i I'm, i i fully agree to that point and i also see that dexes are being like more utilized and we also see like the user 
count is growing, the volumes are growing, but I feel we're not there yet, right? If you look at the most uh, DEX projects, they're still in a very early stage, even like pre-beta, maybe an early alpha at the best, right? Binance recently um, released the Binance Academic Report where JL777, our core dev and founder, and, and Komodo, early days of Komodo basically were credited were 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 listed as the first executors of a fully automated uh, cross-chain atomic uh, swap and that's know-how that's like experience that's the tech we've been like building and working on this is really it's the third generation dax and i'm saying that because it's literally the third iteration of this software and atomic dax the new the, the new dax that we released early early 2019 like early this year is is not just like an optimized uh, cross-chain protocol implementation. It, we also completely changed the tech stack, right, to turn this software a very efficient piece of software. And our main goal was to become production ready, right, to get this beta out, to be able to turn it a public accessible software and DEX and something that's like provable on the blockchain. So whoever uses our DEX will see that this is a truly cross-chain uh, atomic swap DEX. And I think what we, what is going to happen in the next time and what will also boost the utilization of DEX is basically attaching the DEX layer to the SEX layer, to the CX layer, right? So uh, we'll see like gateway implementations, um, API access inside DEX technology and DEX APIs. Just like for one example, just to, to, to uh, refer to what I mean and what we are building uh, Komodo, um, we're, we're integrating like an API interface to Atomic DEX so that an end user could basically use the a, a centralized exchange API key. For example, Binance, right? You have a Binance account, you take your Binance API key, you configure Atomic DEX, a pure DEX, uh, and basically give it permission to utilize the order book through your uh, centralized exchange account. So you could literally take the order books from a centralized exchange and mirror them into the DEX, right? You could add a little margin. So you could basically be buying on a centralized exchange fully automated and reselling the tokens on a decentralized exchange. And you could be orientating towards um, un like unmatched orders, right? User demand that is not being fulfilled right now. And that's how, that's what we think will really like boost this up and we'll likely see um, the tech evolving in, more into the direction of like, um, like some sort like of, 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 of a stage where DEX and CX would basically coexist with each other and sort of like melt into each other. We'll probably even see first hybrid systems by coming year where you'd basically have like some sort of sex, a centralized uh, web application that you could like access, but from within the centralized exchange, you could, you will be able to basically directly access uh, DEX functionality and peer-to-peer -peer decentralized DEX networks. So that's like the vision. That's what I'm like very sure will happen. And I think from there, it's going to just be like a, a normal time, right? Every revolution will take some time. And from there, we'll just see how how majority of the centralized exchanges volumes and, and liquidity will likely move and and flow over to the to the DEX layer. Right. But it's, it's it's probably just a matter of time. Well, so I'm, I'm just trying to follow along with what you're saying there, Caden, I, and I, I think I've got the gist. So. What you're really saying is that, because traditionally DEXs have had two major problems, right? So first major problem is the UI, the UX, really clunky, really hard to use, quite technical. And the second major problem is liquidity or, or volume, the lack of, right? So when you're talking about the ability for users to, or the DEXs to link up to centralized exchanges via API, that's what you're talking about, right? That's about solving the liquidity problem. 
I don't want to say like maybe not 100% solving, but it is a way, yes, yes, definitely. I mean, you're right. It is a way to solve this issue and to support like uh, to, to support this issue, like to just like disappear. And um, I'd also like to add, this is really just like one of these like countermeasures, like an implementations, integrations to, 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 to like basically let the liquidity grow and just to increase the volume in the order books. Uh, we also implemented something that would allow you, that's something that's already being actively utilized in our DEX that, let's say you have like one Bitcoin in your DEX wallet and you want to put up like some orders, you're a trader, you want to make profit with this. Now on a centralized exchange or other DEX, you would be able to just set up like one order or you would be able to just set up orders matching this one Bitcoin in value. Uh, but we thought, why not give a, an end user like the, the possibility to reutilize this Bitcoin as often as you want. Now you have one Bitcoin, why shouldn't you be able to put up a potential order of one Bitcoin for N uh, Litecoins, one Bitcoin for N Ethereums, one Bitcoin for N Komodos, whatever. And what will happen is that with just one Bitcoin, you could potentially uh, create an order book uh, with a depth of like thousand Bitcoins, so different uh, pairs, etc. However, the first order that would get matched would basically erase all the other orders or reduce their volume to basically match the difference to the order that already matched. And this way, you'd see many, many orders and traders would be able to utilize their funds in such an efficient way. And it's a virtually an increased liquidity and, and order book, right? Sure. Why would someone want to use a DEX? So what's what's their reason? Is it because there's no KYC? So you know that uh, that's a that's a compelling reason and if that's the case how does that work if you are linking up to a centralized exchange which has much stricter KYC requirements you know what uh, how does that work from a from a, both a practical point of view like a, on the technical level and also from the regulatory perspective if that makes sense Okay, so, so the DEX itself is like a non-custodial uh, wallet implementation. Basically, there is like no KYC and no regulations. Sure. And um, not, not because like the deaths of all these DEXs are like uh, hyper anarchists and, and don't want to follow rules. It's just because of the technical nature of a DEX, right? Because it's just not possible. However, uh, We've extended our DEX, for example, to allow external parties to set up custodial wallet implementations where they also could implement a KYC layer as something that would be like technically possible, but it would be something that would have like to be handled by like a company, someone that uh, follows like the whole regulationary compliance, etc. and so on, right? So. Uh, however, to get back to your questions, like what's this main benefit of using a DAX or why should someone using a DAX, right? If you care about security, if you care about your tokens, uh, I, I'd say like you're going to use a DAX sooner or later. Um, with a centralized exchange, you need to keep in mind, uh, even if you have like 100 Bitcoins on this exchange, these Bitcoins aren't your exchange, right? May, uh, not your uh, Bitcoin, sorry. Um, maybe from a legal uh, point of view they, they they belong to you right or from an ethical uh, standpoint but technically they belong 100% to the exchange and if the exchange messes up with the private keys or gets infiltrated hacked whatsoever right your coins will be gone right um, actually the exchange coins uh, at that point of time with a decentralized exchange you will always keep full control over your private keys right at no point of time do you give this control away to any other party not even to komodo um, and i personally believe this is like the strongest sales argument uh, we can put everything else aside right the whole vision uh, right the aspect of uh, financial freedom etc right it's all like pretty interesting and also matters a lot but at the end of the day i think this security level right being able to basically handle your your like financial business in a trustless manner right i mean in a centralized exchange 
and uh, in you know in, in this in, in like in this traditional uh, financial world where I also think like centralized exchange somehow belong uh, into the whole math would be based on trust right but uh, with with the dex the the whole uh, the whole trust would be based on math so it would be like basically absolutely exactly like the opposite right and i think that's that's sales argument number one when it comes to a decentralized technology sure and i look I, I agree with that the uh the counterparty risk of having your assets on a centralized exchange is dangerous um but you know from a you know, I guess a, a macro mainstream adoption point of view, Caden, it's can we really expect, you know, the the wider general population to can we trust them to be able to keep their assets safe on a by using a, a decentralized exchange protocol? Um, you know, is uh, is the user experience simple and secure enough to protect people from themselves? Can we trust them to keep their private keys safe or? For a lot of people, maybe they're better just having uh, a little bit of Bitcoin on Coinbase and and trusting Coinbase to keep it safe for them. There has to be a there's a balance between the two, right? Yes, there always have to be a balance. However, I I always tend to like ask myself a question, right? Would situation A make it better, or would situation B make it better? Now, if we take a centralized exchange versus decentralized exchanges as an example. Um, Let's say someone uses centralized exchanges and he gets hacked, right? His computer gets infiltrated. Now a malicious actor will just enter his uh, uh, centralized exchange account and uh, just transfer his tokens out in this scenario, right? Um, in scenario B, a hacker would just hack the exchange and access the user's token without intervening directly with the user, right? If we look at the DEX, right, and try to analyze the difference between these two situations, if a DEX user gets hacked, the attacker will likely be able to transfer his tokens out. However, will it affect anyone else in the DEX? Would the user have not lost his, his coins if he was using a centralized exchange instead? And the answer is no. So. At the end of the day, it would still be better to use the decentralized uh, exchange since it would really minimize the, the, the overall risks. Fair enough. Well, let's just start to finish off on DEXs then. I'm curious, Caden, like, are there any other DEX platforms that you think are doing a Good job. And also, what about the John McAfee Dex? Have you looked at the McAfee Dex and what do you think about what he's up to? Right. I think there are like many uh, Dex projects out that definitely have like a very promising vision and idea. And I also think that like from an ideology standpoint, I would be able to identify with these projects. Uh, however, up to date, I haven't really found any Dex that is uh, close to a beta program or even has like some sort of uh, um, production ready application right so i think st the industry is still like in 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 its early days when it comes to dex technology and we're still seeing a lot of like experimental uh, layers like evolving out of uh, basic ideas and uh, initial white papers and visions um regarding the mcafee dex I just had a talk with, uh, with with a close colleague and developer a few days ago, and I mean we had uh, just a quick rough look on it because we've seen like in the media, um, it's it's been like reflected a lot in, in recently, and um, it, it's been covered by by different influencers and and um, media outlets from the basic idea, right? From from the vision, from what is being communicated to the world. I'd say it's cool, it's a nice idea, right? I mean, at the end of the day, we're all somehow aiming for the same goal. Uh, and that's giving end users their financial freedom back and, you know, just just, just building a, a trustless uh, and, and decentralized uh, f financial layer for our society. But from a, speaking from a technical standpoint, um, I, I still think it's like pretty 
somehow limited. I mean, the McAfee DAX is built on Ethereum. It's a somehow sort of like closed uh, ecosystem. And for me personally, a real uh, DAX would be a cross-chain atomic DAX that doesn't just provide like uh, mother chain based tokens uh, support, but that would also be compatible with other third party. So second and third generation blockchain protocols, for example, if you look like at Atomic DEX, for example, um, it's not just like able to uh, interoperate and, and bridge chains that are based on Komodo to Komodo. No, we're furthermore um, also having this, this bridge over to the ERC, to the Ethereum world. Uh, we have been implementing the Tezos protocol recently. Um, these, these are all these things that, that I think a true DEX uh, should bring. And uh, it should basically cover the whole industry. It should allow you to bridge over to different uh, coin, uh, coin protocols, which isn't the case with the McAfee DEX. I think that's a good assessment. I think that's accurate. And uh... Thank you for sharing your opinion. Let's go to a quick break and then we will come back and let's finish off with the Crypto Conversation Hot Take Ground. Whether you're an enterprise fund manager or a retail trader, buying and selling cryptocurrencies successfully requires price discovery you can rely on. Brave New Coins liquid indices provide trusted US dollar prices for Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Ripple. Featuring end of day or intraday outputs, you can count on the BLX, ELX, and XRPLX for accurate US dollar pricing for smart contract oracles, settlement price discovery, net asset valuation, and performance analysis. Visit bravenewcoin.com to find out more. Caden, I'd like to finish the Crypto Conversation podcasts with a quick round of rapid fire hot take questions. Are you up for it? Okay. I want your hot takes, your hot fire. Take your best shot, Caden, from Komodo. Here we go. Where do you sit on the Bitcoin maximalist to multi-coin opportunist spectrum? I'd say like on the far side of the multi-coin opportunity. Caden, what would you say is your firmest conviction crypto opinion? I really think that blockchain technology will revolutionize the financial system, basically bringing a revolution 3.0. That's something like I'm, I, like I'm 100% sure about. The Istanbul hard fork, Ethereum 2.0, Serenity. What's going on with Ethereum? I know this is a complex and a big subject for a hot take question, but give me your hot take. Where is Ethereum at? Can they scale or are they in trouble? I think they're working hard on scaling it up, right? But I think they're not there yet. Hey, William Gibson said the future is here. It's just not evenly distributed. What's an example of the future being here right now, but most people just aren't yet aware of it? Bitcoin, blockchain, uh, cryptocurrencies are, are a great example for this. And uh, I mean, I, I had a big hope with cryptocurrencies and I thought that they basically fire up like this distribution, this balancing of wealth and, and finances, but I think it didn't happen and, uh, and most people didn't get a piece of the cake. Can it still happen? I hope. On a similar angle, in terms of everyone getting a piece of the cake, universal basic income, UBI as a potential fix for AI-induced automation or the inequalities of society, however you want to put it, is this a good idea, Caden? What do you think? Uh, no, I, I don't think so. It, it somehow matches a more like probably communistic society economy model and I don't think that's a good idea. I, I really think like a meritocratic uh, based uh, economy model, like society model would be the way to go. Okay, Caden, let's zoom out. What do you think is the long term future for the human race? Do you see dystopia? or utopia? Uh, unfortunately, dystopia. Yeah, I think we're gonna completely screw it up and, and uh, yeah, irreversibly um, destroy our species. Oh, that's a shame. How long do you think we have? If we're lucky, um, under 500 years, and uh, if we really go um, wild, um, I'd say under 100 years. Wow. What is the most likely cause of humanity's demise, do you think? 
uh, either a disease that we won't be able to heal fast enough, uh, right, with uh, uh, nowadays, uh, uh, yeah, research and like also like negative developments in this field. Uh, another scenario would be like uh, a world war, a third world war, that likely wouldn't last long. Sorry, there's one more scenario and that's like AI, AI killing us all. Oh, of course, <laughs> the Terminator scenario, I love it. Speaking of the Terminator, uh, Caden, finally, what is your favorite science fiction book, film or show? Star Wars, yeah, definitely. Excellent. Thank you for talking to me today, Caden. Please, the microphone is yours. Take us out. Tell the people where they can find you on your various platforms and where they can go if they want to go down the Komodo rabbit hole. Oh, thank you so much, Andy. It was really a pleasure being here. To all the listeners, please, if you're not aware of Komodo and our platform, just feel free to visit our Discord Uh Check our infos out at komodoplatform.com. You can find me in the Komodo Discord channel, in the IRC Proofs Anonymous channel, and on Twitter. Thank you to Caden. Thank you to Komodo. Links are in the show notes to the Komodo platform and also to the Komodo Atomic Dex. Caden and the team, they actually are right on the bleeding edge with building a true decentralized exchange that can enable atomic swaps. It's really interesting technology. They're certainly ahead of what someone like John McAfee is doing, that is for sure. I thought Caden was extremely diplomatic in his assessments of the McAvey decks and also in his opinion on Ethereum, the Istanbul hard fork and the, uh, the Ethereum scaling narrative. Not sure if anyone else picked up on this, but I couldn't help noticing that Caden is another one of these really smart people who have spent time at the higher levels of government behind the velvet curtain at an OPSEC level, and he seems to have come away from that experience quite disillusioned. And, you know, he now thinks that a, a decentralised internet is really the only viable counterpoint to the surveillance state. Also, if you heard my interview with Tao Cole from Orbs, which was the Crypto Conversation podcast, episode 15, Tao had a really similar experience, actually. He spent time in the Israeli 8200 military intelligence unit and came away from that with quite a dystopian view of humanity and humanity's chances of survival just like Caden what he said at the end there in the hot take round absolutely fascinating I uh, I thought anyway hey thank you for listening this far got some really interesting episodes coming up to close out this year just in the next few weeks including an interview with Andreas Antonopoulos so that is very exciting plus a couple of other really fascinating guests that I'm working with so please do make sure you subscribe to the Crypto Conversation podcast so you get a notification when those episodes drop but for now that's us this was the Crypto Conversation for Brave new coin. <laughs>